So now we're going to move into the second part, which is a roundtable, conversation, debate. And you are all asked to participate and more specifically. We will have a round table around, everybody sitting around the round table. You can see how round it is, obviously. So we have General Pli, who is uh, in charge of Aurore, who heads the Aubervilliers Therapeutic Community, 1,600 employees in charge of uh, social integration, uh, human uh, suffering, uh, um, pain, all the other aspects that they deal with. Thank you very much. Dr. Sasta Saga come from, comes from London. He's number two of an organization called Ad Action. They are among the three top organizations called TAS statutory, statutory companies in England. 1,400 workers or employees involved in help relief, uh, aid of um, addiction, suffering patients, particularly member of the Royal College of Psychiatry. Welcome, Dr. Agath. Thank you for being here. <coughs> Professor Michel Reynaud that we heard earlier, he is one of the drivers of the fight against addiction, I would say for addiction rather. Without you, a lot would never have happened. So thank you. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Part of your action uh, was described earlier. Dr. Mario Blaise, um, Blaise Marmottan, the psychiatrist, mindful. Mindful, fully aware of addiction and mindful of addiction. And then Stéphane Priba, who is a, a, a part of the French National, uh, he's one of the uh, elected officials of Paris, one of the boroughs. Uh, he's next, based next to the La Riboisière Hospital in the 10th borough. And, and he allows, in a safe way, to addicts who are suffering to come and use some of the safe uh, sh uh, shooting rooms, 500 people a day in those shooting rooms. And so we are here to talk about the various steps or various aspects of addiction. And in the room, we have you. But here sitting in the first row, we have several people that I want to focus on. My friend, my old friend, uh, David de la Pan. Not old because you're old, but old because we've been friends for a long, long uh, time. And uh, the implementation of what is called the Minnesota model in France, you've been one of the drivers on that. Coming through North Carolina via Turkey, Nikos Strom, who is also one of the drivers looking at addiction through C4 solutions, uh, body organizing conferences, support in the United States and elsewhere to help people find the best possible solutions. And your contributions will be essential to what we do. And then another person who speaks French very well, that's Ian Young. He comes from London. He's a very specifically engaged professionally. He's a shrink. I'm only a shrink, but he is an interventionist. When you've reached the REM stage, you don't know what to do, and we bring him in because he's, and we will ask for your uh, experience. Maybe not right this second, but in a minute. Why don't you wear your headsets, right? It doesn't work. It should work. Ah. Uh, Vincent. Vincent Fiat, thank you for being here also. Like Jean-Paul Bruno just said, you're his right hand. You're also very committed in 
helping identify how it's possible to tame. That's a word I was given one day. How can you tame the drug addict, lead him forward, help him? What brings me to tonight's theme? The addiction universe evolves and develops fast. Our answers, treatment, communities, continuum of in care, internet, school and prisons, our strengths and weaknesses. Huge, isn't it? So we're going to try and do our best to uh, touch on everything and see where we stand, what the state of the art is, share our positions here. And my idea is to start from this continuum <laughs> position. When you're still suffering in shame, in fear and chaos, where do you find help? Where The idea is not to die. And if you want to go on uh, using drugs, then what do you do? And then there's something that I'm interested in. It's the uh, therapeutic help where the addict becomes a patient, starts to see himself or herself as a human being. The seeds of hope appear, which is wonderful, however hard it is. And then several times today, we heard we have to go on stopping and it raises problems in terms of jobs, housing, parents, children, ex-wife, future wife, and uh, uh, work colleagues. How can you come back to work with your load of shame on your shoulders? How about I'll help. I'd like you to start by telling us why was someone in this particular borough of Paris ready to launch into this help and, and set up the shooting room at the Lariboisea Hospital? Thank you very much to all of you. And thank you, Christophe. Uh, so I'll uh, go for it. And first comments, I might be the only non-specialist in addiction here tonight. And, and that's not why I'm here. First and foremost, I want to share with you the experience, the experiment. It's been taking place for six months now in the 10th borough of Paris to try and give you some focus on what the work is for a local elected official with a group of elected officials working with this population of people who often are homeless and deal with their deep addictive behavior, how to help or set up facilities, I would say, to help them um, stretch out our hand, be in contact with them. So do stop me if I am too talkative, because that's what I tend to be. The 10th borough in Paris is the uh, Gare du Nord station, railway station, and the Gare de l'Est railway station. It's northeast of Paris. And for the longest time, it's an area where drug, various types of drugs are used in uh, the public uh, areas, in the 11th, the 18th, and the 19th borough also. Since the 80s, I would say, there have been facilities made available for this type of uh, profile of people, and they are there, offering uh, ways of uh, acquiring products, uh, uh, moving around, and less and less, not too long ago, there was this capacity to hide, to be able to live in parallel, in the margins of society, as you can in different countries. The train stations are often areas, and still are, areas where you can easily hide whether you are a drug user 
or uh, on the run or a prostitute. And so in that particular neighborhood, you have um, vending machines distributing um, what you need, equipment, to be able to use clean equipment. And there are French structures, you're probably aware of them, uh, Carude, Extrepa, and others, for risk reduction. And uh, that's where people can uh, start uh, dialoguing and talking and having clean material. But in your group, I know you have some structures, some 10 uh, meters away from the room that opened up, the shooting room that opened up six months ago. So the people who come went on staying locally in the car parks, in the different buildings, using drugs and mostly shooting themselves or inhaling drugs in an area where people lived on a daily life, uh, carried out their daily life. And so things were criticized, but chaotically yet, things were organized. And then following a lot of work done by some voluntary charities in the end of 2000, uh, France started looking at these shooting rooms that you find in foreign countries and that have proven their efficiency, certainly bringing people off the public areas. And so the city of Paris and the 10th borough uh, were involved in this. And so in a nutshell, the shooting rooms in 2010 is when the first public authority started looking into this. They started by creating an, um, some educational material, organizing conferences, working through health networks to try and collect knowledge and share knowledge with experts, with the, the police, local police force, and on so forth. And so proposals were made at the time, and the national strata of the public authorities started looking into this, and they were completely against this possibility. And the 2012 um, presidential elections opened up a door, and then the legislation changed, and the Council of State decided that changing the legislation was something difficult. And so whatever was being done in that neighborhood stopped immediately so that the legal framework could be adapted to what was being done. That was done at the end of 2015. It was called the Health uh, Legislation. It was the Health Act. Actually, it became the Health Bill uh, to be able to bring down uh, and contain damage and set up one of these shooting rooms. It's called room in France. It's called room of lesser risk. And the official administration presented their point of view and set up, therefore, this legal framework, which led to the local borough to be able to set up one particular location at the, in the heart of Paris. <coughs> it's within the Lariboisière Hospital without being exactly inside it, but it's still dependent on the hospital. I, I say that because it's very important. That was one of the points. I can talk about that if necessary, but that was one of the points of friction with the people where the local uh, population wanted to define clearly where that was supposed to be done. Originally, it was supposed to be in um, sort of a, um, a brown field area around Gare du Nord, and uh, everybody decided against it because there were no doctors around, it, nothing showed 
that the people coming there in those brown fields were being medically monitored. So it took a few more months to turn the project into a reality. I've brought a few documents if you want to look at this and will tell you more about uh, how our project has come to fruition. And so since October 2016, the shooting room is open with we, what we feel is definitely success with a high frequency level. We don't have 500 per day. 500, over 500 people who are registered and some 200 come every day. And all this corresponds to our need right now. So in terms of a frequency rate, it's a success. In terms of support and counseling of the people, that's good also in terms of family and of, of social integration. And it's through this consumption, this use of drugs, that we are able to deal with them. We are able to bring together people who are completely in, uh, in the margins of society, and they can meet with social staff and medical staff. <coughs> so success for the users, for the facility, even though there still are difficulties connected to this. And also, it's a success in terms of public calm, tranquility. When this room is open, nobody else is around those rooms, uh, taking their fix, using their drugs in uh, the open uh, air, in other words. But but we're still talking about an area where drugs are being used in the northeast of Paris. There are people still there who are using the car parks, the public toilets, to use and to, to uh, shoot themselves or whatever it is. One more thing, and then according to their question, to your questions, we can always pick up on wherever you would like us to go. One of the characteristics is that we are in Paris and, and we need to know how we can explain people what using drugs is all about. And of course, you know, in France, uh, we are not that rational, actually. So it's very difficult to get the people to understand that we're working on this. And then also, the idea is to um, uh, set up structures at the foot of the peoples, of, of where people live, uh, to avoid the NIMBY uh, uh, phenomenon. And, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at social structures, uh, neighborhood structures, uh, you know, um, council housing, that type of thing. You see, every time we, want, we try to do that, people have a very strong reaction. And, uh, uh, of course, if you give me more time, I can tell you more about this, but maybe we'll get back to this later in the discussion. So, uh, you know, as a therapist, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, yeah, okay, but then what does Mario Blaise think about that as a psychiatrist? How do you mean about this uh, shooting room? Well, for, for me and my colleagues at Marmottan, it was obvious that such a system was lacking in the French uh, healthcare system. You know, I was talking about multiple points of entry into um, healthcare. Well, this is one of those points of entry because it's one more interface between uh, caregivers and drug users. Plus, as you explained very well, it's uh, uh, located in a place where people would use on the streets or uh, hiding in uh, uh, squares or public gardens, etc. And so these uh, uh, shooting rooms in France and in other countries were actually set up to meet local uh, problems, local issues. And here, in that case, it's certainly a key location for that. We have 
uh, clients or patients whom we see in Marmottan who also visit the shooting room. They say it quite openly to us. And uh, I think uh, this is now part of the landscape, uh, naturally or more or less naturally part of the landscape now. You know, I'm not sure you can really call this a natural thing. But anyway, it's uh, really part of our landscape, part of our mindsets. And the people are very much aware of this and they appreciate this. Professor Renault, back to what you were saying. Well, this microphone doesn't work. You'll have to use Mario's mic. And uh, oh, we're only getting this little microphone for two of us. Yes, you have to. Um, we are talking about um, the population, what they think. Uh, first of all, I have to say that I've been supportive and still am of these uh, shooting rooms because to me it's a way for the people to suffer a little less and to meet people who maybe will help them come out of it. So I have no qualms about that and I've always said this publicly. However, it happened, something happened to me very recently during a psychiatrist's congress. I bumped into a former colleague who was a very nice a lady, a psychiatrist, a left wing, a very humane with a very ordinary population of patients who was very much used to mental suffering. And she said that she has her practice on that street, on the street where the shooting room is located. And she said that it had become very difficult for her and for her patients because the population that came to the shooting gallery was uh, actually generating a certain number of nuisances that she mentioned, you know, basically um, they had antisocial behavior. Some of them uh, had actually a threatening attitude uh, to her patients, or that's the way her patients see that. See that. Well, I understand now. I, I want to congratulate you because it took a lot of courage to do that. So I'm happy that you did it. But you also have to understand, and I know that you're open to that, that uh, some local people have difficulties with that. And it's their right you know, to protest against the filthiness and against antisocial behaviors, that type of thing. So how can we do this? If we want this type of structures to be accepted, we need to ensure minimum tranquility for the people living there. Of course, we don't want to have cops at every street corner, but uh, how can we do that? Well, very briefly, I can tell you a few words about that. One key element for us is that right from the beginning, we um, be we recognized the people, the inhabitants, and we understood that they were uh, willing to be informed about what was going on with this uh, uh, shooting room. And we have a neighborhood committee that meets every six weeks, which brings together people living there, people working in the buildings in the neighborhood. And uh, we also have um, care professionals, health care professionals, etc., plus uh, um, donors, etc., and, and local authorities. So it's important for us that everybody can express themselves, including people who disagree with the thing. Because what's important for us is to create a place where citizens can share information and discuss their opinions on the integration of this uh, shooting gallery in their local community. Because, you know, this local community uh, is, uh, was uh, strongly impacted by drug use for a very long time. And sometimes people thought that it did not exist just because it was not happening right on, at their uh, doorfront. But, you know, tomorrow I'm going to meet with a collective of 30 people whom I've met with last week already, you know, and they're not happy. And because they had the impression that there was no problem because before it was not on that street, it was on another street, the, the, the street right next to it. So what can you do to ensure that there wouldn't be so many problems for these people, even though they had the impression that there was no problem before and now there are problems. That's, that's the way they see it. Well, let's not get into that sociological discussions of neighboring environment. Let's try to focus on people who are suffering and uh, addicted. This leads me to a key question. I'm sure that it's better to smoke a pipe of crack in a safe place uh, than on the street. I'm, I'm certain about that. And I'm a, uh, a former user, so I know what I'm talking about. But why? what's the uh, desire for change? Because here, you know, people feel comfortable. It's almost like a ritual going into that safe room. So what, what's the motivation to quit then? 
and uh, because that should be the purpose. Um, the, the experience in the U.S. is important in that respect. You do need a microphone, yes. I apologize for not standing, but I have blessed my knee on the escalier for 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to speak in English because sure. it's a little complicated. I need to get current and inform everyone that I am 32 years in recovery, and that will very much drive my answers. Um, I was very impressed with the facility. I, I visited it on Monday. I admire your political courage, and I think in the sum of all things, it's an absolutely necessary first step that we need to have. My concern is that after 32 years of looking at harm reduction, harm reduction always becomes a discrete modality. And there is no effort made once people are stabilized in a way that reduces public nuisance, et cetera, to move them towards recovery. And it always seems to me that we are taking away their right of choice by basically making it completely easy for them to maintain their addiction. And so I've always ethically had a problem with that as someone in recovery. Now, I'm a realist and I realize 25 to 30 percent of people will need to be maintained. I understand that. But there is a large percentage of folks who are exposed to harm reduction who get stuck there, who do have a chance to have a better life, who do have a chance to get unstuck. So um, I, I completely admire what you're doing. We need needle rooms in America. We're way behind the times. But the experience in America with substitution therapy is that overwhelmingly people who start substitution therapy never move on to recovery. And so that is a serious ethical decision. And, you know, I'm not saying right or wrong, but I think it's a decision that requires a great deal of thought. Merci, Eric. Um. Thank you, Eric. Which leads me to the central question, motivation. How do you motivate the people? Maybe it's because I work in London, but uh, Dr. Agath, motivation is something that we see in some NHS units in the UK. They use a lot of motivation interviewing, the type of things, which is a technique aimed at motivating the persons for going into the process of getting to the idea that maybe potentially someday you might get to change. So I'd like to know what you think about this concept of uh, uh, shooting galleries and also thinking about motivation a little bit because we've, we've got to go deep into that and uh, uh, the, see what you think about this. Uh, thank you. Um, it's a very interesting and very brave decision to have a shooting gallery, not to waste about that. And uh, I have massive respect for that. What happens in the UK many years ago, the Roundry Foundation at the end of the previous millennium provided a report that was uh, saying that it's, it is a useful modality. Nevertheless, it was bringing two very important issues. The first one, the problem with the social integration, to what extent you would be able to accept in your own neighborhood. There's always someone else in the neighborhood that was important. And the second is that the concept of the continuity of care, which was mentioned by Eric earlier on. I think the latter point is very important. We exist within addiction um, specialism, addiction services, to, uh, um, to pay our respects to a, a simple principle, survival permitting the person overcomes their addiction. This is what drives us in what we do. We believe that all the other things being equal, you know, and people don't die because of infections, of bad things happening to them, they would eventually conquer their addiction. That's the principle. We don't say it very openly, but that's the whole idea why we have all this service around us. So the main issue with the shooting galleries is the fact that it's a standalone modality that it doesn't give you the opportunity to work with the client more uh, in terms of raising the concept of there might be life out there uh, in other words, to use your, uh, your term, Christophe, is to uh, 
uh, work with them motivation. Motivation interviewing is very, very powerful within our sector in London. It's, it's uh, elementary training for the frontliners, the people who see, uh, people who have problems with substance misuse, irrespective of their background. So it's not only the, the hardcore clinicians or the very experienced and senior people who are being trained on that. And the idea behind it is to actually stand in the interaction with the client to show the understanding, the empathy, I know what you're going through, but at the same time to show them there might be a different way, there might be something else that they haven't mastered. And is that process tried to identify the m smaller thing that probably might be a driving force for that particular person that leads to more of our successes. Sometimes it might be someone's drive to become an astronaut, but the majority of the <coughs> times is about having an allotment somewhere where, without needing to shoot. You know, being able to have a cup of tea with uh, their, you know, their father who they are not in speaking terms for the last 20 years. These simple things. And this is what we try to identify to get out of motivation interviewing. What is it that makes people tick? What is it that could actually work and help people go to the next step? Merci beaucoup, Dr. Thank you very much. Motivation has something to do with dopamine and the regulation of dopamine. So I wonder, you know, when you find a motivation factor, maybe you're actually already treating the dopamine-related issues uh, in addiction. Now, talking about motivation in your action, we try, you try to find solutions for people who are suffering, people who are in pain. Before this conference, we're talking about housing, we're talking about concrete problems which are very difficult to manage because when you don't have um, anywhere to sleep at night, well, you're in trouble, right? That seems like stating the obvious. So how do you uh, take into account uh, the return of hope and how does addiction fit in? You know, we have Susie who works in the field, but in Aurore, how do you view things? Or what's your, what's your personal view on things? Well, we actually work near this uh, needle room because it's in the golden triangle of, of uh, drugs in Paris between the 18th and 10th arrondissement. So we have a carude there, uh, an emergency uh, center there. But, you know, basically they uh, clean up the neighborhood a lot, so the neighborhood is cleaner than it used to be, and then there are fewer visitors to the needle room. The people who go there, therefore, they have more time to take care of them, and so they can do something more than merely distributing clean needles to them. So that these types of rooms can make sense if they are part of the local fabric and if other players uh, add their actions to that in order to make something bigger. Also, this place is located in a very specific area of Paris. You know, it's in the Goutte d'Or neighborhood where you have Espoir Goutte d'Or. It's an association that was created 20 years ago. They, they now joined up Aurore. And they were started at a point where uh, it was really the most difficult time for drugs in Paris, and they worked a lot on communities. They uh, worked with users, with uh, local people, with associations, etc. So they held general assembly meetings and a whole lot of things. And now Espoir Goutte d'Or is uh, an association that really fits into the neighborhood. That's because they've been there for 20 years. And so I think that about this part of the debate, it's very important to see where we stand. And now at the opposite of that, we have another carude in Aulnay-sous-Bois, just across the street from Cité des Bodot, which is the main source of drug for all Parisian drug users. The um, uh, clientele is mostly people who inject, you know. And uh, basically, this is a hub for uh, distribution and the dealing, and so and, and they also have a needle room there, and uh, they start. Uh, 
they try to work with the people. So you've indicated the limitations of those centers, but in Olney, there's nothing they can do apart from distributing clean needles and trying to talk to the people. So the question is, what tools do we have at our disposal? And should we not try to have a greater array of tools, which I think we should. Now, Professor Renaud, did you want to say something? You were looking at me like as if you wanted to talk, not this microphone. Oh, once again. So I wanted to say that you, sir, touched on a fundamental question, which is being in uh, some comfort zone, uh, does this make you continue using? Well, this is an ethical issue, which we can also look from a different angle. I think that, you know, it's never suffering or pain that is the main driver for somebody to stop using drugs. Or addicts, whoever they are, can uh, do things uh, which are unthinkable to us. And to us, the substance is more important than whatever consequences they will have to suffer. So giving them a place uh, that is um, peaceful and quiet, you know, giving them uh, uh, needles, of course nobody would challenge that now, but if we didn't have a clean place to do it where they could actually sit for a moment and talk and find somebody who's um, in empathy, you know, and if they can do it, because most of them are totally outside of the desire to, uh, uh, to, 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 to recover, you know, but some of them going into this different structure where they will meet a psychologist or an educator or, or somebody and then thinking maybe they would go into a substitution treatment. When you say that um, substitution therapies, people continue taking them, yes, of course, but we've heard that for so long. And we've seen on top of that that some, a lot actually, of patients um, heroin users actually changed lives and got back to an acceptable level of life. So when you weigh the pros and cons, well, there's much more pros, really. It's more beneficial to continue with a substitution therapy, for example. Of course, it's better to stop altogether, but when you can't, when you don't have any other solution, it's better to go to a needle room uh, with a lesser level of risk than to shoot yourself without any contact with somebody who someday might extend a hand to you, right? Yes. And I'd like to pick up on that and on what Eric Pliez was saying about this concept of network and working with partners. This uh, shooting room in Paris uh, is connected to the addictology uh, ward of the Fernand Vidal Hospital, which is just a few hundred meters away. And this is a connection that already existed before. And it was increased, and now they have more hours of collaboration. It's never enough, of course, but they already have people who were referred, who were sent to the hospital because they had been made aware, because they had started to understand that their life was no longer possible as it was and that they wanted to change it. And it's because of this room and the contacts that they made there and because of the partnerships that the needle room had that they were referred to the hospital. And so maybe they're not going to completely recover, but at least they're going start a journey into recovery and it's something that comes from them well of course just a second we're not gonna spend two hours talking about that but what I remember from that is a certain number of things first of all it's more comfortable to be in a room than to be in a gutter uh, to shoot yourself then of course it's uh, um, not very positively seen by the neighbors unfortunately it doesn't generate uh, positive uh, approach of uh, addictive disorders, fewer people die, and it also works better if you involve all the players, as Eric Pliez was saying. This is a summary. Did you like to? Add, did you want to add something, Rick? And then, uh, yes, I totally agree with what you just said. Totally agree. Because almost everywhere, I've been in, I've been around for 32 years. Okay, I've seen, uh, I've seen from no harm reduction to Ethan Nadelman on steroids. Okay, and I've seen it in a lot of different countries in a lot of different places. And it is too convenient for policymakers to stop. And so the trick is, how do we? give people a little more of an opportunity without trying to force them. And I don't have a solution, 
but I'm saying we need to be careful that we do keep that thought in mind and we don't just stop at the convenient, because remember, this is not just harm reduction for the addict, it's harm reduction for the politicians. And, and so uh, that is a, I mean, we have to be honest here. The primary driver is that it's harm reduction for politicians. And, and I don't say that cynically, I say that as a realist. Uh, and, 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 and that's not judgmental, but I'm saying it is important okay. that we try to go the extra step. Okay, alors je vais juste prendre la parole. C'est très intéressant. Yes, very interesting. I have to say this. Well, the usual thing is happening that a friend of mine was uh, talking about uh, last week. When it's about making something legal, well, in all Western countries, everybody agrees and everybody says we should throw all these people in jail, sorry, and send them to a judge. But when it's about therapies and it's about what to do, we have this debate. And, but you know, in the meantime, every four seconds, somebody is dying because of drugs, right? So we don't want to go into a controversy here because otherwise we're going to be drowned and we're going to kill a lot of addicts because, you know, we haven't done anything in so many years and we cannot afford that luxury of letting these people die. I will hand over to you in a few minutes, but I would like to move on to another topic which is of extreme importance, I think which is motivation. Motivation, again, as we were saying, motivation is the only reason why you would want to help yourself. And motivation, what I discovered in the UK, is that um, it's the interventionist. And Ian, it's going to be your turn in a few minutes. So get ready. And so the interventionist is a pivotal point that exists in the UK that I haven't seen in any other country. So Jan, can you please explain us two things? First of all, what's your job as an interventionist? Just a few sentences, a few words. And then secondly, how does it work when people are still in pain in drug consumption? And how do you manage your intervention? when uh, you are going nowhere, where you see that you're going nowhere and it takes time, how do you manage to remain an interventionist when nothing happens? It's quite a delay when you're listening to this. Um, I think I can answer both of the questions with one answer. Uh, as an interventionist, my role is to, to respond to a family when they're in crisis and they care about someone who doesn't want to help themselves. Um, so... T uh, typically, the mother will call me about their son, and uh, the son is very happy attending shooting galleries and doing whatever he needs to do to make sure that he feels great on a daily basis. But the parents are, are pulling their hair out, and they're, they're very fearful that their, their loved one is, is, is going to perish before they recover. Um, my technique would be, I use motivational interviewing with the family. So I ask the family, what is it that they would like to see happen for their loved one? What's the best case answer? What's the best case scenario? And most parents, or father, wife, daughter, what they're looking for is for their loved one to be happy, joyous, and free. They want them to be drug and alcohol free. They want them to get a job. They want them to get married. They want them to be, you know, they want them to have a quality of life, um, which, which I believe is achievable through residential rehab. So we agree that the goal is residential rehab. That's going to be the outcome of the intervention. And from there, I then have to find out what it is that, <laughs> why it is that the addict is still able to carry on drinking or drugging, living at home or living in this environment. And, and, and I'll go around the family and I'll be asking them how they are enabling the, the addict to continue living this way. So are they giving them money? Are they giving them shelter? Are they giving them food? Uh, are they bailing them out of prison? Are they driving them? Are they allowing them to have the keys to drive drunk? Are they giving them access to their children when they shouldn't be? You know, and I'm looking for the ways that the addict or the alcoholic is getting away with their lifestyle. Because one thing I know, is a you know, I'm a recovered addict, um, 16 years, so half the time. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, but, but I know that there is no motivation for me to stop while I had people that are around me that were making sure that I didn't have, that I had drugs. And, you know, and I'm very grateful, uh, I didn't get shooting galleries, but I'm grateful for needle exchanges. Uh, as, as a result, I don't have bloodborne viruses. And I'm grateful for the other services that we had in the UK. However, when I was looking for 
a detox or, or for an abstinence-based model, it was very difficult to find that, and it, was t it took the private sector. Uh, I, I was actually a patient of Robin's at the back, and it, it took the private sector for me to have a solution that gave me exactly those things that the parents tell me today that they're looking for when they're addict, when they're, when they're feeling unwell. So, uh, so I speak to all the family, and I find out what the enabling patterns and behaviours are. And I don't even meet the addict. They're the last person I want to talk to. Um, I, I, I coach all of the family members privately. And when I believe that we're ready, we have a structured process where we will invite the addict into, into a, a, a room or a family meeting. And uh, through a structured process, we will confront them from a place of love. And, and that's really important. This is not about shame or bullying or being resentful or angry or pointing the finger. This is actually about expressing love as a, as a, as a family member, saying that I care about you this much, but your drinking and your drugging is making me feel this, and as a result, I'm scared, hurting, angry, lonely, worried, concerned, whatever. And so we're, 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 we're matching... Uh, this energy of love that the addict is feeling, because we try and get them first thing in the morning before they're too drunk, um, with the realization, maybe for the first time, that their drinking or their drugging is affecting the people that love them. And when they, they have that realization, most of them will, will accept the help that we're giving them. And so essentially, I then take them straight off to a rehab. Um, if they are resistant at that point, which does happen, then I use all of the, the, uh, the, 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 the issues that we, had clear, that we had identified earlier that, that they were using as enabling patterns, and I threaten the addict with removing all of those crutches. So the mother is going to say, I'm not going to feed you anymore. The dad's going to say, I'm not going to give you any more money. They're, they're not going to bail you out of, out of prison. They're not going to give you the cars. Uh, you're not going to have your... Any, um, we're going to tell your work that you're drinking on the job. We're going to essentially crash the party and remove all of the good times that you're perceiving with your addiction. And at that point, the addict or the alcoholic will have this moment where, because I believe that they're motivated towards, pay, uh, towards pleasure and away from pain. And so what we're doing is we're giving them this massive perception of a real hard time that's going to happen, that, you know, that's just massive fear. We give them that, that, that perception of fear without actually having to deliver it to them. And with the, the, the sudden awareness that their family are being led by someone who's also an addict and therefore knows what's going on, they, they have this moment, and I, and, and I cry when we do the interventions, because it, it, it's such a precious moment where you see the addict's spirit leave the body for a moment, and, and you see them as, as the child or the adult that they're, they're, they were spiritually meant to be. And, and at that very point, we have a breakthrough where they accept, they accept the graceful exit from their addiction, and we ship them off to rehab. So, Merci, Yann. Merci. How we do it. Merci beaucoup. Um, Dr. Blaise. Dr. Blaise. In Marmata, you're receiving people. You've talked about families. What is your point of view on the message quite clear from Ian Young on this particular part of intervention, which seems a bit brutal sometimes. I was witnessing this, and it's also full of love as well. Paradox. It is true that to listen like that, to listen to this, it's fascinating. I mean, you see right away, you can see the living picture of it and how things happen. At the same time, It might be difficult to know how to position ourselves, how to intervene, what is your positioning when you're cold. I'm thinking it might also be um, one shot. I don't know how to say, but uh, it might be something that happened once and sometimes it works and sometimes not. And, and why not try things like that, I'm thinking. What I'm hearing here is how the position of families is a leverage and very, very important resource, and how um, an addict, how much, how they're not alone, they don't live alone, there's always people around them. And so to know how to leverage the addict with their relatives, I think it's extremely essential, as you describe it, it's extremely, yeah, interventionist, and we understand that, and, and maybe we should 
still every time think about how to do how to have leverage with the relatives on the addict whether friends families it's a huge um, resource that we're certainly not using enough you know the thank you very much dr blaze what is little by little leads me to that idea that is we get to tell each other the solution that is wished for is to end up in abstinence, not in, in terms of not consume, but in terms of existing without even have to think about consuming products. So we get little by little in that model. I'd like to um, hear uh, Dominic McCann, if if you're um, 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 if you want to share your experience in the management of patients in Carlson Craig when they're not when they don't want to be here, basically. You need a mic. Hello. So <clears throat> I didn't really uh, prepare myself to speak, but I'll say a few words to introduce myself and what I do. So I'm the director of a treatment centre in Scotland, which has 120 beds and you know, currently maybe about 90 patients all being treated for drug and alcohol addiction. And we provide an integrated treatment um, program which starts with detoxification usually and goes on to a, a period of uh, psychosocial rehabilitation and treatment lasting for several weeks, in some cases maybe several months. Uh, for people who just stay for several weeks of course the treatment has to continue, especially has to continue um, back in the community when they go home and so for some people, you know, the treatment is really just a first stage. For others, uh, it's a, you know, it's a six-month treatment plan and, uh, and continuing back home. So I think the other aspect of integrated is the psychiatric care. So we have a full-time uh, team of psychiatrists who are employed in the hospital, and they lead a multidisciplinary team, including psychologists, psychotherapists, uh, nursing staff, uh, there's a resident doctor for general medical needs, and there are, um, of course, fitness trainers and other, uh, let's say, complementary therapists. So that's our, our, tre our, our treatment uh, setup. And I would call it, I would describe it as a complete treatment environment. So uh, treatment is happening 24 7, and we provide not just the full expertise of staff and treatment, but also a high quality of environment, taking people away from the normal cues or triggers of their drinking or drug using lifestyle, and putting them in a place which is considered, uh, always has been in human culture, considered a healing environment, which is the beautiful Scottish countryside, or um, could be equally be Switzerland or um, another part of France, but to a beautiful place. Um, in order to receive this treatment. I think it's a, I, I think that um, I mean, we, we publish our outcome studies and we have quite a high um, success rate. And by success, I'm talking about two types, really. Uh, we primarily measure people who, uh, people's ability to remain abstinent from drink or drugs after one year, one year after treatment with us. And then we, but we also measure um, a reduction in severity of, um, of problems, so general improvement. And that figure is also very high, about 90%. Um, you know, you do see an overall improvement as measured using certain scales. And I'd say um, our outcome studies show a 50 to 70% abstinence rate after one year. Um, so. And that's of people looking at everyone who came into treatment from one week until, you know, five months. So there's a wide variety of, uh, of um, treatment duration within that. So, um, so that's what we provide. And I, I think that it's uh, a highly effective um, and excellent model of treatment. Um, but, of course, you know, it's not uh, possible to have a Castle Craig in every town or city and there's very few such institutions in Europe at the moment um, and, uh, and so for that reason um, we're very interested in coming to France, coming to other countries, talking about what we do 
and seeing whether it raises any interest or questions amongst the medical community and uh, the psychotherapy and um, psychology community. Merci beaucoup, Dominique. Ma question était comment fait-on avec un... Thank you, Dominique. My question is, what do you do with a patient who doesn't want to be here under constraint? What do you do with a patient under constraint who doesn't want to be in Castle Craig? A patient, who, a patient who doesn't want to be in treatment, well, we can't force them to remain. We don't take people, um, for example, we can't accept, accept someone who is under section. They need to be released from their psychiatric section in order to voluntarily come into treatment. And they need to remain in treatment of their own volition. If somebody is thinking about leaving and um, we, we rather think they shouldn't leave, then we'll organize something of a, an informal um, intervention within the community. So this will be a chance for, um, for the other patients to talk to this particular patient um, in a controlled environment with a couple of um, psychotherapy staff members and to discuss their, their reasons for leaving and to see how, as a group, uh, that discussion happens and plays out. I think that within the first few days, especially the first few days of coming into treatment, nearly everybody seriously thinks about leaving. Very few people find uh, the initial phase of treatment easy. Uh, but, again, of course, you know, the only reason that we remain open and successful as a treatment center is that we help the majority of people through that, um, that initial week. And by the time they're into their second week, it's usually a much smoother treatment experience. Merci, Dominique. Merci. Eric Pillet, vous vouliez intervenir. Um, Eric, did you want to intervene? I was going to say, we're talking about people who could find the door and knock on the door. What becomes of the others? That's the question, right, you have. Or have a, a beginning of an answer, which is always, always stretch your, you know, legs permanently. First, welcome uh, people who are in a process of abstinence, and then the others. The question is, what panel do we give at what time in their lives? And in all of this, what hand do we hand to them? You know, what, what, what do we do we give them throughout all these steps? I've known, I mean, I've worked as an um, educator in the, back in the 80s, and the only rule was uh, withdrawal, you know, a detox um, cure. And after one cure, we tried to offer some housing for people who, were, who wanted to go away from their neighborhood or their family. Or, and it was true with drug or alcohol, we were, I mean, the norm was ban, forbidden. Somebody who came in a home, um, and somebody who, at some stage, uh, you know, relapsed, and it was very common to relapse, well, he was kicked out. And that was it, because he was disturbing the group. And we still have those old reflex in France, like, um, because we still have those old habits, because with the 115, which is the emergency call line for social housing, you know, social shelters, some people are blacklisted from those um, home for the homeless because they're too agitated and on drugs. And the true question to me is, how do these tools now adapt for these public coming. I'll give you an example. We have a facility uh, for, you know, the most excluded of the homeless in Bologna. It's a shelter. A lot of them are men. A lot of them are uh, have big problems with alcohol. And rather than choosing to forbid, we chose a half process. That is, people won't sleep elsewhere when they come and they're drunk, but we ask them to leave their product at the gate of the center. And if it's needed, they'll come discuss with the caters and maybe drink it during the night rather than having a delirium attack. So it works well. How are we equipped? And that's the question. As soon as you have walls, you have rules to follow. There's a group. It becomes much more complicated than when you receive people in free consultation and they do whatever they want outside. So that's it. The question is how and how far can we achieve just to people and with that idea that we are taking them we are nudging them to care for, gradually if we can so that's the question for me thank you very much Eric um, Robin thank you I'm Robin Lefevre director of promise clinics and uh, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk here. And I, I, I would actually like to give credit to another clinic that I witnessed in Malta uh, called Caritas. And I'm so sorry that the sisters aren't still with us because 
It was a, it was a, a rehab run by a church. In fact, I saw it, I was, uh, Dominic's father and my father uh, set up some of the first clinics in, well, his father before mine, actually, uh, the first clinics in the UK, and I was with his father in Malta, uh, and we, we both came across this clinic. What this clinic did, which I thought was so clever, is they had outreach workers, as we would call it, sorry for the translation, um, in the park, basically, uh, encouraging addicts to go to a drop-in center, like a shooting gallery, to get clean needles, to get maybe onto substitute medication, etc. The workers at that unit would then work with people and encourage them to go to a detox unit. At the detox unit, within the same organization, they would encourage people, they would say, look, I've seen you on your third detox now, maybe you need more than a detox. They'd say, why don't you go to our rehab unit? They also had a secondary care unit for people after that. They also had a unit in the prisons. And my point is that the whole thing was integrated and it was owned within one organization. And what was so clever about it was that if somebody relapsed, as people do, out of either the detox unit or out of even the secondary care, they'd go back, they'd come into the park, they'd meet the, <laughs> meet the person in the park again who would say, well, guess what, have you thought of dropping around to the drop-in center again and seeing the guys there? The reason this is so important, I think, is that at the moment, and what we're hearing to some extent, is there is a, a factionalization. The people who are working in the uh, shooting galleries, uh, actually not the people working in them, some, but, but there are people, okay, mm -hmm. last week I met with a professor of addiction who looked me square in the face, and I, I only have 25 years of, of recovery, but he looked me square in the face and he said, well, of course, Robin, you know there are people who just won't become abstinent. You know, people who are, you know, sort of highly successful or whatever. And I'm thinking, even just following social media, you can see people with very long-term recovery. Recovery is possible. And I think the most important thing is that we must keep in mind that that is our goal and our objective. And it might be that when we're working in a drop-in centre or we're working in the park just trying to get in, encourage addicts to come to a drop-in centre, that that's a goal that's a long way off. I don't think we should ever take our eyes off it. And I think this is where this organization did so well because it owned, I suppose, all of those different types of treatment. And I would love it if it was possible for all of our staff because, like I say, my work is in a clinic that's very, you know, abstinence-based. We only do sort of residential sort of detoxes and, and, and the traditional thing. Um, but I would love our therapists to go out and work in a shooting gallery or whatever and experience what it's like to be at that very, very early stage just looking for a little gain, looking for safety for our clients. And I would love the people from the shooting gallery to come to our clinics and m see people who are longer term in recovery, who are getting six months and 12 months absence. And I'm not saying that that, that doesn't happen, but I sense that there is this sort of division, which I think is a shame. And I think Caritas, that clinic in Malta, showed us all a very good model of an ideal of how all these systems can actually work hand in hand. Merci beaucoup, Robin. Merci. Um, Mr. Fiat, um, you've heard a lot of things, and I'm saying. DVO, the philosophy of DVO. I'm in deep respect for this, and it comes after all this chain of, of... So how do you hear this debate? What's your reaction? I think we're very, very lucky to live in a country where we have lots of solutions. I think risk reduction is great. In the EDVO, we're welcoming people who've tried to reduce their... to cut down their consumption, to reduce it. They have quite often 10, 15, 20 years of consumption behind them. They've had lots of um, detox, lots of... Um, they quit a lot of times and they saw it wasn't working for them, not for them, right? So volunteering, personal, you know, will by personal will, they've decided to go to total abstinence. And I'm totally in agreement with Mr. what he said about recovery process. I agree with what you just said. I think there are several possibilities. And I think it's really good to have such a broad panel of um, people here. I'm coming back on um, not the ambitions, but the choice. Um, that why would a, would a drug user stop? The motivation, yeah, the motivation. For me, it's the consequences. And unlike what I heard, I find in my own personal uh, case, what made me stop 
uh, quit is the consequence of my consumption. And when I decided to quit, there was one person, one center, one addictologist, there was one GP maybe, one psychotherapist maybe, um, and he was there. And he, there was somebody to tell me, yeah, there's a way out, you can exit, you can quit, and you can go there if you want to quit, and that's what mattered for me. And really, consequences were important for me as motivation. Um, I mean, needle rooms, I mean, there's less consequences, and so for me, it's a worry. That's clearly, and for me, it's worrying. Thank you very much. I want to give the floor to Jean-Maxence Granier, because we're going to talk about um, treatment without treatment. What happens if you, 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 you're not seeing any, any professional, but you go in a room with this, there's many other people? What was your question? I missed your question, sorry. What happens when you don't go into a needle room, nor see a psychiatrist, nor a psychotherapist? Well, there are other rooms, and you can go there. You know, absolutely, yeah. Just one thing I wanted to come back to. In the spirit of the last speaker we had, in our conversation, there's two images, two places that popped up in my mind. The supervised um, needle room in the 10th district in Paris, and then the treatment center in the Scottish countryside, beautiful countryside. And we felt these two places were opposing with very different publics. Are these two places are not secretly related? Are they not allowing those, you know, both places, addicts, subjects, to seize or seize again their lives into their hands? Maybe they do it very differently, very differently in both places, but there are similarities. And the role of people who are worried about these questions is, in the spirit of what was said before, is to make sure those places conjugate merge and, and maybe create journeys, dynamics going from risk reduction to, indeed, solutions, among which solutions you got abstinence, I mean, that is not excluded, but offered like an interesting lead, like a documented and, 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 and solid um, uh, solution. And many people can test, you know, test, you know, testify about that. That is one thing that is at stake for me. And the second thing is, is a question, should we not transform, uh, I don't want to be giving you a caricature, but should we not turn our society into a huge supervised needle room where you don't just trust law and forbidden things to make progress because this room is absolutely, let's say it's a legal void room, uh, a giant room where everything is um, decriminalized based on the 1970 act, normally people in the room are committing an offense, right? But maybe including the social field, like the neighborhood, or maybe the whole society on the question of addictions, maybe it's a central thing. And maybe consider the addict um, subject, despite his alienation, a subject able to make choices, maybe not to um, have HIV or maybe need to not have one additional abscess and maybe not shooting in, you know, uh, uh, you know terrible conditions or maybe um, the, a subject able to make a choice to, to recovery. There's a lot of similarities. Professor Renaud, you wanted to? experience, clinical experience, taught me that there was not one solution and that it could even be different for people according to moments, really. So I'm very humble and, um, and maybe we'll have problems agreeing with each other. I don't believe there's only one solution that's the right one. There's one solution at one given time for one person. And I think we have to have a panel of uh, solutions so the person hangs on and holds on before being hooked by something else, right? Um, we talked before about addiction, and for me, addiction is something like, um, it's like a need for love. It's like a love disease, a need to 
restore self-esteem. At some stage, you have to find that, and that's what self-help groups does do. Sorry, and that's what therapists bring families as well. That explains um, effic efficient strategies showing that people are loved. But sometimes we cannot understand and hear that you're being loved. Not all the time. Not like that. And the possibility might be okay. Needle room, abstinence uh, place, a therapist. A group. There are so many solutions. Of course, it's more complicated than the idea that only one thing works. It's more complicated to handle. But you, if we want to save a biggest group of no, you know of people, we have to have a very broad panel of tools. And every one of these addicts can actually hang on to this for, in their story. Thank you very much, Doctor Agath. What about the British panel of solutions? The range. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to share a couple of reflections, which I'm not quite sure how UK specific are, and uh, but uh, I think that's probably worth doing it at that point. I'm between two minds. Tell me to shut up if if they're not relevant. Um, we discussed quite a lot about how to make sure that uh, the addicts do give uh, get opportunities to survive, the first principle that survival permitting they would give up. However, implicit in what we've been discussing in the contributions was the concept of the pathways to care. In other words, that you have in your mind John Smith, who is going to come in contact with the system at some point. It might be a needle exchange facility, it might be a shooting gallery, it might be a GP, his dentist, you know, casualty department, it might be in prison, yeah? And that person would be taken by the hand, laughed, because that's very important, what do we do? And then hopefully is going to graduate into uh, going through the um, picturesque unit in Scotland or perhaps in Malta and then gets, uh, get on with their lives when they, uh, they complete the treatment. The truth of the matter, though, what I've just described is captured with a pathway to care, a way of standardizing more or less how someone would get to that uh, so elusive um, abstinence, if you will, or control of the addiction in order to do other things in their lives. Um, so the concept of the pathways to, to care is, is, um, is so, you know, 2000. And the reason why is that, although it sounds like an excellent idea, you start thinking, what about that John Smith? Um, is he black or white? Is he male or female? Or is he transgender? Does he have kids that they are around? You know, does he have problems with his lungs? Most of the people I see nowadays, they die from problems with their lungs, not with hepatitis. You know? So there's so many other things around the integration of, of, of uh, the, the, uh, in an attempt to uh, create order out of the chaos that most of our clients would live in, that I would have thought um, it would be an oversimplification to see a linear model. It doesn't, in my mind, is not really important whether there are many linear models and you, you get into this uh, pathway from wherever you start. In my mind, the following things are important. I'll tell you some very practical things from UK experience now. Um, if you overhear someone talking about having a contact with their uh, child, you know, five-year-old child, that child, you have the same primary responsibilities towards that child as you have for your client. You know, you cannot pretend you didn't hear that because you might need to be able to inform the social services. I'm not saying you should, you might. So that's an important issue. The, this is something new in our agenda, the fact that children are very, very important. Equally, um, we have this uh, concept of the safeguarding. We have the, the, um, the responsibility of sharing information if we think that something is not right about our clients. We have to be mindful of confidentiality. You know, there are uh, people in their own right. But what do we know from all these inquiries that happen in, 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 in UK about fatalities is that there are patches of the system knew that something was right, but they were not talking with each other. So we have some responsibility of sharing information we think is of importance, and whether that would be perhaps, I don't know, a shooting gallery or a needle exchange facility or, or, or a surgery. 
Um, we have this concept in, in UK, the third concept, and, and I'll stop it uh, uh, at that. Clearly, the primary responsibility for, uh, um, for a child, the, the responsibility for safeguarding and sharing info, uh, information, perhaps overriding COVID in child some sometimes. And, and then there is a third issue, um, which came with the third concept, which is about the concept of the professional curiosity. <coughs> If you hear that something is not right in someone's life and you think it's important, you cannot pretend you haven't heard it. You have to go about exploring it. It came as a major, major drive that, again, is in the UK legislation. And it came out of a lot of fatalities again. People hear things and not acting on them. So, forgive me with this round, but basically what I, shared, uh, what I said in a nutshell is that it was my impression that we were actually our responses collectively were addressing an old conceptual model of trading addiction, which is the concept of the standardized pathway to care. And what I tried to show is that the agenda is far more complex nowadays relative to where it was about 15 years ago, because we are um, we're a um, developed world and we have all these extra problems, extra responsibilities. But we will win, that's the bottom line. You know, the agenda is far more complex, but, you know, if you from the contribution, all of us want to win. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Agat. Merci. Je vais avancer sur un thème. I'll move on because time uh, flies. We are transforming the addict into a patient in our debate, so I'm not far from my guiding you know, line or thread, I'm trying to wish to, to comfort myself with this thought. There's a place where we find a lot of addicts, not because they get together, but because we're putting them addicts. We're putting them in that place. That's the prison. And that's, uh, of course, um, the consequence of political choice. I'm not supposed to have an opinion about it, but I'll have an opinion about it. Anyway, uh, what about prisons? What in France, what happens? It's a place where you can do things, right? In England, you have wrapped. Uh, which is the biggest, um, you know, care center is in almost in the prisons, you know, they don't have much of a choice and there's not much to do. So a lot of colleagues actually work there in different prisons and they all came back with the same thing. Well, you know, we have a lot of time. I mean, so we'd rather, you know, follow the wrapped rehab system. I have a lot of contrast, you know, um, uh, you know, opinions from ex-cons and so on. But anyway, what happens in France? What do we do with prisons as a care, a place of, you know, uh, detox care? Or do, 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 do. Anybody? Ha if we haven't got an answer, that is great. It means something. Do we have any answer about what happens in prison? Well, it's no good what happens in France in the prisons. It's no good. Up to recently ago, we didn't even know that there were alcohol drinking among people who are in prisons, and half of them have alcohol problems, and they're not taken into account. And for most of them, as soon as they leave, they resume. And because of AIDS, there were a certain number of um, support services to um, struggle you know, against um, drug addiction. So there are mechanisms only in prisons, but we fail to, I mean, we don't think they are sufficient when you look at the need. Um, uh, and then you've got products coming into prisons, syringes being smuggled into prisons. And in the same time, the principle of risk reduction does not apply in prison, so patients can't have any care for that risk reduction. So that's a place we don't want to hear about in France. And, and that's, I think, in any case, I'm not working there. Maybe some people do it very well, and I don't feel that the answer is up to the unmet need of the sickest and the most people in distress are in prison or in the streets, and that's where we have the smallest answers, the smallest response, you know. The Anglo-Saxon uh, theory is all drug consumers are in prison, so because we have, they have nothing to do, so we treat them, and we do very active psychotherapy. Rick, did you want to... To the US and the UK, um, pour juste qu'on compare un tout petit peu le modèle. In two words, please. Yeah. Um, prison treatment resources in America are, are rather limited. And um, I, th I think that most of the systems in America uh, that exist in prisons are pretty much done. Uh, first of all, you have to remember in America that the prison industry is extremely large. It's a private business. Um, it's a private business that has a vested interest in maintaining its clients. 
80% of the inmates in America in the prison system are nonviolent drug offenders. And basically, they're running a hotel business. And the way they keep the beds filled is to make sure those folks don't get well, because 60% of the 80% go back to prison if they don't get effective treatment in prison. So basically, they resort to two ploys. One is to deliver services that are completely inadequate but look okay on the surface. And then the other thing they do is that they regularly vote to increase funding for prevention because they know all the prevention in America is completely useless. But they can't come out and vote for funds not to be allocated to treatment where that would not look particularly good for what we call optics in America. So they're quite Machiavellian and vote for the money to be diverted to, um, diverted to uh, prevention. Um, I, the best prison services I know of are wrapped in the UK. Um, I don't think there are many people I've talked to who would dispute that, but I'm certainly in no way an authority uh, on prison treatment services. Merci, Rick. Um, Thank you, Rick. There's probably something to think about in the French national um, program. There's a huge contrast. Eric, Aurore is um, an association that's now 145, that's 45 years. Prison is part of uh, the DNA of that uh, group, this association at least, working with uh, uh, people who actually come out of prison. And so what's very important is to work with people before they leave uh, the prison. We have a um, structure that we work with for women who often uh, leave after uh, being in jail for a long time due to drug-related crimes. And they will be reintegrated thanks to all of this preparatory work. It takes several years to prepare them. Uh, they're allowed out once in a while. They are prepared. It calls for a lot of relationships and a lot of trust developed there. Now, unfortunately, nobody's here representing uh, prisons. And Christiane Tobira, when she was a minister, launched a lot. And she launched an experience, uh, probation services, to prepare uh, people being released from prison. And they worked with Bobigny, which is one area north of Paris, using a principle that is used in Canada for a suspended sentence against following a program of care and of social work. Some 30 people have done this, so it's a very small sample, but it seems to work quite well. I would almost say obviously, but it's people who people would have been jailed for short sentences. And the success rate is quite respectable after two years of running that program. So it's a good thing to think about this, but we see how difficult it is to deal with. But I'm afraid this program is soon going to be phased out because we're going to be building a lot of jails. So some choices have been made also, some different types of choices. There's a question from the floor. Um, we need the microphone. We can't translate without the microphone. We need a mic, please. Thank you. Probably a little bit easier. Now about the prison question, it, it, it regroups a lot of the themes for me that I've heard today. Because we know that in England, with RAPT, you mentioned RAPT and how successful it is, we have outcomes, you know, it's evidence-based. We have a program and we know how it works. So it, you would imagine that it would be so simple to say, okay, here we have a country with, you know, scientific evidence-based outcome, you know, research based on, uh, on um, evidence. Let's just put it in France. Because isn't that what we do? Isn't we, like we look at CBT and how that worked with Aaron Beck and then we kind of like did it all over the world. And with harm minimization, for example, you know, we, wherever your position, whether it's 12-step Minnesota model, 
you know, because th that basically, a lot of people are against it because of that. But for, for children between the ages of 40, going up to 21, harm minimization works. They're not going to go to meetings, and very few of them are going to go to uh, treatment. And in, it, when, when you have disruption in a, in, a, in, a, in a part of the city like you do in France, Gare du Nord, that whole area is, you know, it's traditionally the drug area in, in, in Paris with lots of young people. Harm minimization is probably the only thing that's going to work. It works in the UK, we do it in London. So, what I'm trying to say here is, it's not, and, and I, I, I t the, the gentleman from Ad Action, I think, you know, said this in a different way, is what we need to do is take the things that actually work, that we've seen working at elsewhere. For example, the 12 steps work. The Minnesota model works. ACT works. You know, even things like, um, you know, mindfulness meditation. Alan Marlat, Marlat, he's dead now, but he, in Pennsylvania prison, worked with the prisoners with mindfulness meditation and did outcomes, and we saw that it worked. So what I'm trying to say, in a nutshell, in, instead of sort of saying, well, you know, which is the best, or, you know, actually just take all the modalities that work to treat this condition, addict, you know, this, this life-threatening condition, addiction, I, I, I'm, you can hear a little bit of emotion here, because I am emotional about it. This is a disease of isolation. And I was thinking about the harm minimization, just the fact that young people are in contact with other people, you know? They're not isolated, they're not alone, they feel like they belong. Because this is a disease that wants to get you in a room and wants to kill you, you know? So what I'm saying is, all these initiative, initiatives are fantastic, what we need to do is use the evidence, you know, solution-focused, evidence-based research and just do it. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Merci. Merci beaucoup. This leads me to a question. It's probably one of the last themes that we're going to raise tonight. This morning I was uh, suggesting that addictive disorders are brain disorders more than mental, that addiction is a compulsive um, situation and addiction is more or less short, long-ranged. And then we can talk about whichever country. We've talked about three countries here. And so I have a question that might be more for the doctors and psychiatrists who are here among us. What is a patient? You talk about people, the individual, what's at the center. When do you think that someone is a patient? Are we going to work with a patient in depth, its difficulty of being a human being, or do we deal with a patient only when it comes to its dependence? How do you define this notion of patient? How far do we want to go? Because there's also the, uh, you respect the individual. You've got this whole spectrum. How far do you want to go? It's very complicated is the answer, but, well, the answer for us, a patient is somebody who comes and uh, asks for help. I'm paid for that, and so after that you use whatever you want to use. And then in terms of public health, a lot of patients who don't come, don't come for help, but nevertheless I try and work out the different categories to see what would lead them to help elsewhere. Not with me, but there are other systems that would allow us to, to move differently, maybe with people who are close to them. How can you use their close um, people around them to, to work with them? We're all a little bit sick with something. And so, and it's once you go see the doctor that you become a patient. Mario Blaise. It's a question in terms of terminology also. In Marmottan, at the beginning, because we wanted to be anti-psychiatrist and androgerian, the people who came, we called them clients. Clients, because we wanted to show the difference uh, between them and uh, what is uh, psychiatric and ill and what illness is all about. So people who came, were people asking for things and uh, who wanted to use whatever we could offer. We were offering services to customers.
and we tried to stay focused in that way. Then what was astonishing is that our customers, our patients, don't like that word. You see, what do I mean, customers? You're not dealers. Don't call us clients. So they seem to challenge this idea of client. They would rather be called user, patient. Other facilities try to use other words, acting, entity, whatever. And so the terminology also leads to a lot in terms of where you position yourself, in terms of the relationship. But what is important is how you go on asking or challenging yourself in terms of the relationship. Thank you very much, Mario Blaise. This approach, the semantic approach and epistemology is very important. And EDVO, how do you refer to your residents? Residents, right, thank you. It's the same individuals, isn't it? And so that's very important that we actually highlighted this. At least you know who you're talking to, why you're talking to them, and what word you use. Stefan, you wanted to say something? Yes, as a non-expert. I have an idea. The patient is not the one that you leave in the street in a very dire state. And so anybody in that uh, situation can become a patient one day, somebody with whom we can actually uh, carry out an action in and I hear what you're saying about uh, uh, shooting galleries or needle rooms and uh, and I think it's those are places that can help if you don't allow these people to go into these places they'll never graduate to the status of a patient and I'd like to move something to something more when the patient becomes a human being, to stay sober, to stay abstinent, and the addictive personality does not live well with abstinence. And so this permanent difficulty of uh, what I call the crocodiles that are close to uh, the to the um, boat. And David, I'd like to give you the floor so that you can share with us on this about this continuum experience. And then, how can you stay clean, basically? David de la Pen. There we go. Si, si, si. I'm a psychotherapist and have been doing that in Paris for 20 years. First of all, thank you to all of you for all that you have uh, explained, all that you've submitted to us. And I'm a fan of what happens after. What, what you see every day in your uh, clinics, in your shooting galleries, in your hospitals is frightening. And what I'm interested in is what happens afterwards. As Professor Reno, you said, addiction has to do with love or lack of love. I went to London on the Bowlby theory of attachment. I did a doctorate on that. And I tell my patients, I love you. Well, I'm not going to kiss you on the mouth, and we're not going to go out together. That's not what I mean. But I need to love them if I can help them. And if I can launch this aspect, then I will reach my end. Also, we need to support. What I say is that we're in the same boat together, but we don't know where we'll end up. And so I just wanted to pick up on this. It is so important. The fact that I'm able to go on working with these patients, and every morning I look at my schedule and I say, wonderful. And for that, you need that interaction between them. 
and me, and, and that's what they feel. This is what helps us move things forward, and that's all, what I, that, all that I want to say. Thank you very much. I'd like to add something. I think what you're saying is really the crux of the matter. It's true, addiction is a, a disorder of attachment that you solve by using products, and it works for a while. But then, to be able to regain this uh, love connection with others and to be narcissist in, narcissistic enough to move forward, this is what we have in common. Whether we're dealing with individual groups or support groups or in hospital, it's difficult for me to say I love you, so I don't really tell my patients. But something happens when you're really interested in someone, and I think that's what the patient feels. The patient is somebody who suffers, but also the one who comes for help. And I think that a relationship is created here, and it's true, it's not the same. The patients go to doctors and then they become residents or users. Each one uh, is looked at socially in a different way. But there's always this connection that is there to return the person into a narcissistic person again to be able to move forward. Thank you, Professor Renault. I am intimately convinced that the reason why the uh, human species uh, survived is because we grouped to survive. And without empathy or with no love in, em in the empathy sense of the word, we would never have been able to move forward. I mean, we had to uh, uh, fight uh, saber tigers uh, years ago, and that's because we did it together. And so this is what I hear, empathy, the interest displayed towards someone else, towards your neighbor. And before that, I was quite attached to white powder and vodka. It, uh, it uh, replaced uh, another attachment, an older one, that I was uh, missing. But I won't go into that. I mean, that's my life. And I, we've come to the end. And I'd like to give you each the floor just for a couple of, of sentences, no more, to summarize, to, to tell us what has struck them here in this day spent together. We'll start with Stefan. Well, a uh, pass? No, 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 no. The pleasure to exchange, to um, to be in the same area as everyone, and to share experiences. Yes, I think this sharing, sharing of this love with one's neighbor in their difficulties and the way to tackle the difficulties, do as best as possible at one time in life. Thank you, Mr. Blaise. Dr. Blaise. What I've been impressed with in this discussion is this possibility to dovetail quite a few approaches without really being in disagreement. And of course, it can differ depending on the time in one's life and uh, the route followed by that one person, I think uh, each one needs the freedom to find exactly what is best for themselves. And this is the basis of my ethical approach for care, and that is not have ideas for the others. And you can make proposals, obviously, but too often, we are in debates where we have ideas for others, other communities, other others. There are always people who have ideas for others, and I don't like that. I don't think it's very helpful. Thank you, Mario Blaise. I will almost to repeat the same thing. In fact, what I was moved by is the positive side of humanity. I'm always pleased when I see people who uh, pass on um, help and see that some groups are ready to be involved to help others and to feel this motivation in a society 
which is not a, a, a needle room with less risk, but uh, a high risk uh, consumption community. Well, that's difficult, but I don't know if the message has come across clearly, which is the three of us saying that there isn't one solution, which is one prototype that will adapt to all of the different uh, approach, uh, situations of, of suffering. No. And these situations of uh, uncontrolled uh, reactions. So you need a lot of flexibility. It doesn't mean that there aren't proofs. Uh, there are ev uh, there are evidence-based results, as somebody said earlier. But there's so much bias, we need to be very careful. What works is difficult, we know. But we have a lot of scientific data that shows that some types of uh, pathways work better than others. Uh, bringing down, uh, it works well for outpatients, for instance, for some, but not for all. And we've only talked about substances. We didn't talk about sex food, purchasing binges, social status. I think we need another full week to do that. Dr. Agath? Thank you. Uh, 11 hours ago, we started this conference. I feel the same energy that I felt 11 hours, uh, 11 hours ago. It doesn't happen to me very often, I can assure you about that. And that speaks volumes about the truthfulness of the contributions they came throughout this day. Uh, what I've heard, I've heard polyphony, but I haven't heard heterogeneity. You know, more or less have far more things in common that we have in difference. And I think this is a wonderful initiative, and hopefully we'll see more of this. Thank you. Eric, everything's been said, or almost. I think we talked about empathy, relationships with the other. We didn't talk a lot about um, mutual help, mutual aid, support. And I think that's one of the keys that helps us transcend our differences in points of view. It's the support by the group. I think this, there's a consensus here to say that it's true. Uh, relationships with others is important, supporting uh, therapy and all that. But the group that will help and that will play a role, that's very important. And certainly when that group <laughs> receives the power to act, that's one of the keys for the future. Thank you very much. Right, well now, my task is to thank all of you. I really feel a deep sense of humanity, which I think is remarkable. This might be a drop of water in the ocean, but I think we need to go on. I think we'll be back in October. Thank you very much.